Hi, I'm Dan Schmidt. I do a motorcycle racing TV show for Team Chicago Challenge. My email is teamdan45 at gmail.com. My website is teamchicago.tv. As I fight with Cooch over here, speaking, Cooch is another friend. Cooch was the fifth president at Toys for Tots. So we had Toys for Tots people here. We had car people here. I have a one the community came together for this great event. Come on. Bill Will did a TV show. 175. I got my 175. Thank you very much. Who else? Who else? Come so on. This is the second I'll get these two guys. I need family to please you guys. Another bit out. 200. He's got 200. I got 200. Like to know, Come on. Get it up to 200. And, it's and you know what? I'll tell you what we're going to do. Besides that whiskey stuff there, we're going to... It is early morning. June 5th, 2022, cars are starting to roll in. The Bill Wilt Memorial Motorsports Show is an Amtrak from flashing through Willow Springs, Illinois. And I had the opportunity to talk to one of the early risers. They're setting up to sell pork chops. I'm gonna to talk to the president of the Willow Springs Lions Club. Lion Rich Bergassi, president of the Wool Springs Lions Club in Wool Springs, Illinois. District 1A. Have the club, how many years? Our club was founded in uh, 1954. 54. We've been doing this for 10 years. And uh, our main goal we used to be for blind people, and now it's we help everybody. Anybody that needs help, village wide, out of the village, tornadoes, everything. All the money we raise goes strictly for donations to people. We don't use any for ourselves. Thank you, Rich. And your pork chops were delicious. And now we're looking at a 51 Chevy. Pat Ostrom owns this car. He's an old friend of mine. He's also part of the Toys for Tots crew. My name's Pat Ostrom. I'm also with Toys for Tots in Chicago. Uh, I bought this car about 14 months ago. It originally came from Michigan where it was restored and the person passed away and the person in Chicago didn't do anything to upkeep it and I bought it during the snowstorm of Valentine's Day of February 21 and uh, had to go through it, not rebuild anything, detail it out, change all the fluids, uh, put aftermarket co cover seats in here got the, the radio and I didn't know about the ashtray in this. What do you think the ashtray is on this? Oh, I don't, not, oh a hidden ashtray, right, right. And, and, okay. Yeah, in the back it, they're hidden in the armrest. In the armrest. Yeah. So what is, so what engine and... Uh, uh, it is, uh, they call it a stove boat six cylinder. It's a 238 uh, salt lifter engine. It's not, I mean, it's the original engine, but I, it's been probably rebuilt, I say, two or three times in its lifetime. And the paint is 1992 Cadillac Forest Green. But that was close to what they would have had then? No, the original color of this car was fire engine red. Oh, really? So I wonder if it belonged to a municipality. Right, right. I found out inside the trunk underneath when I was changing the speakers. Thank you, Pat. Your car looks wonderful. And now we're looking at the Batmobile. This is the Batmobile based on the Batmobile from the TV show. The folks from the Claremont Collection Auto Museum in Chicago brought the Batmobile to the Bill Wilt Memorial Motorsports Show. And I should tell you that the war bike, Bill Wilt's creation, will be at the Claremont Collection which is in Chicago, it's close by Belmont and Cicero. Let's talk to Bob Olson from the Claremont Collection Auto Museum. Sir, Claremont Collection's Car Museum in Chicago, and we brought out the Batmobile to help celebrate the Bill Wilt first annual Memorial Car Show. And we're located at 3117 North Knox in Chicago, started by a World War II veteran, 94-year-old founder, and we are now open to the public Thursday through Sunday. 300 cars on display, and the Bill Wilt War Bike is going to have its own section at Claremont. We're excited to have it there. Thank you. So tell me about the 
Batmobile. Sure, so this Batmobile accompanies, this is the old school, the classic Batmobile, uh, reminiscent of the original show. It's built on the uh, chassis of a Lincoln Futura. So it's actually a, a Lincoln, it has a 460 Ford engine in the car, it really hauls. And uh, this particular car, again, it accompanies the 1989 Michael uh, Keaton one at the museum, and it's just a fantastic piece. Families and kids love it. With the uh, advancing and the re-celebrating of uh, a lot of cartoon and uh, uh, superhero movies now, anything that has to do with uh, families and superheroes is, is, is fun to bring out. And you have other Batman at the collection. We, yeah, right. The, the 1989 Michael Keaton one with the with the uh, uh, gun turrets that elevate out of the front walls of the fenders. Really, really a cool place. Thank you, Bob. I hope to be working close with the Claremont Collection on the northwest side of Chicago on Knox Avenue by Belmont. And as we all know, Bill Will had maybe the most popular public access television show in the entire nation. And the reason being, the lovely ladies of motorsport were in every show. And lucky for us, Kim Donahue and Allison Damore showed up, put feathers in their hair, and started to sign autographs for all the fans. I want to thank Comcast, Cable, and Chicago Access for running a couple of ads that I produced. They inform viewers of Motorsports Unlimited, fans of Bill Will Show know about this event on June 5th. And I have the opportunity to talk to two lovely ladies of motorsports, Kim and Allison. I'm Kim Donahue. I started Motorsports Unlimited in 1990. I was 18 years old. Bill found me at a car show when I was working at McDonald's. So after it was over, he came up to me and he's like, you want to sit down? You want to do the show? Two days later, I went into the studio, did some promos, did it for five years after that. Love that guy. So did you go to um, Chicago Access first, or did you go go to Elmhurst? Elmhurst. Yeah, the one in Elmhurst. Right, right. Not oh but you did go to and Chicago yes, Access too. That's where we right. did all of the uh, right. uh, uh, the pieces. We, when we, the girls were laying on right. the poses where we introduced the pieces. Right. Yeah. Introduce and I'm Allison Demore. I came in a few years after her. She was her cohort the whole time. We were always on for most of the time together. Uh, loved it. I ended up staying on like nine and a half, almost ten years. Uh, the opportunities we got uh, from the motorsport community were amazing. Bill was great. Uh, what he's done for the movement is beyond wonderful. The community is so great too. We would have guys donate their cars, expensive equipment to for us to race, and we would do shows on them, and the whole show would be of Allison learning me, learning to drive a front engine dragster or Kim learning to drive this yeah. type of car. And just the fact that they trusted us enough to do that and it made wonderful footage, wonderful shows. And I think that's where the followings came. Yes, we were the goofy girls with the feathers in our hair, but because of those feathers, everybody I watched. think we brought in tons more people than if you just zoom by and I, saw a bunch well, I of know. boring men. Because I know, because I do cars. a TV show. <laughs> and I don't get the amount of... You gotta have girls. You gotta have That's, that's why, why when I wrote show. that, when I put that thing together, I said the lovely ladies of motorsports is who created and it the really audience. was. You'd be flicking through your your station, and you'd go right by a car show with mm -hmm. boring talking about cars. But if you flicked through and you saw feathers in people's hair with high heels and bustiers, you'd be like, well, I'm gonna stop and watch this and see what happens. What the heck are they doing? And people still to this day go, I don't get it. I said, you just got it by not right, getting right. it. All right, give me a word about Chris. Oh, Chris. She was like our mom. She was, she was a mother figure. She took care of us. I miss her. When, when she passed away, I cried for a week. She she was like my second mom. And she, she was 
perfect for Bill. They 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 were perfect for each other. Chris was actually the one who recruited most of the girls, and thank God for that because I think she he was a little more picky maybe with who she got on, but she made it fun. We would be some of these shoots would take us 14, 15 hours. Oh yeah, and you had a meet and you had a meet, days you had a meet at his house. Oh, yeah, you got it was dressed a up. Long, yes. They were yeah. long days. Yes. We were stuck with each other in the van or in a truck or in a car. Right. And because of the camaraderie with Chris, yeah, and making us all feel comfortable yeah. right. and right. right. It was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. No, Chris was great. Yeah. 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 She, always, she always called me Schmittel, So uh, <laughs> We're going to call you Schmittles now. You're <laughs> Schmittles to us now. No, we, uh, that was heartbreaking news and, again, very unexpected. Right, yeah. right, right, so. right. So what have you guys been doing? Uh, well, I've been married for 21 years. I have two boys, one's in college, one actually came here with me. My husband's here. I actually have a 1966 Pontiac in the show. That was originally my parents that was on Strat's car show in 1990 when I first started the show. <laughs> so it's kind of cool that from there, 30 years later, I still have it and it's back here now. It looks great. Got to go see it. Yeah. Uh, me, again, married now 28 years, two children, a son and a daughter. One is a zookeeper. Uh, over at Tropic World at the zoo. One is on WG and okay, radio. Um, and I still do theater in the local area. I was focusing mostly on children's theater, but I'm getting back into adult theater now. So, still active. Great. Thank you, Kim and Allison. As we take another look at the war bike, Bill started to build this in 1977 or so, and he would invite all his motorcycle racing friends to come by and take a look at the different paint schemes and help him choose the proper paint. One of those friends was Tim Farrell. Hi, my name is Tim Farrell and a lifelong Chicago rider and racer and grew up uh, in Chicago suburbs. So uh, growing up, uh, Bill Wilt's name was one of the first guys that as a kid, I would uh, always uh, think of as a hero out on the track or building bikes. So uh, whether it was Santa Fe Speedway in Hinsdale, watching him race there and uh, uh, or competing with him at the ice races. He was always the guy we aimed to beat or tried to talk to about setup and stuff like that. Just a wonderful guy, uh, you know, an amazing friend uh, for the whole motorcycle community. So uh, we're here today to celebrate, you know, his life and what he did. And just looking at some of the cars and the, the war bike, uh, again, just brings back memories of how far ahead he was as a thinker. So I just really cool stuff so we're gonna miss him but just love all the memories that we had with Bill. Thank you Tim. Bill realized as I did in 1977 when I promoted the Team Chicago races at Santa Fe Speedway that we the motorsport community were not getting fair coverage from the TV industry and we did something about it. First, Bill created the Motorsport Advancement Crusade, then both of us started our TV shows. Bill was very observant of life, and the two of us understood quite a bit about the broadcast industry and the law. But it was, it was unique in that, like I said earlier, few things anger me more than when I hear someone say he's good with his hands. We don't say that about a surgeon. Why do we say that about well, a let me, mechanic? My, it, it annoys me greatly. And what was brilliant about Lane Tech was that they somehow combined the, like you do with a surgeon, they somehow combined the fact that, yes, because they have hands, doesn't mean their hands aren't connected to their brains. They have to have something in their brains to tell their hands what to do. Right. And Lane Tech was a unique school that way, and it's all gone. So, right. Listen, someone somewhere has to do something. It's fine to shuffle paper. But sooner or later, someone has to make something, or right. we don't have anything. Right. And it broke down between the uh, the people that believed that America must have a free marketplace and operate with the free marketplace principle, and they predicted that what would happen is that the weaker radio broadcasters will get tired of it and fail, and the stronger ones will survive and prosper. The other guys were saying, "No, oh, no, wait a minute, that's not really happening. And if the government doesn't get involved with this thing, we're never going to have radio." Well, by 1927, it didn't make any difference which side you were on. The fact of the matter was, it was chaos. The problem is, it's an agonizingly slow process because we deal with our little public access station that releases Chicago and ours out to some of the right, suburbs right. and that, and we, we communicate through that, and they communicate to the entire nation. Right. <laughs> Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Right. So it's a, but, 
Ideas have consequences. This can work. It really can. If we can get a few folks talking about this, and they can get a few more folks talking about it and starting to understand how their interests are affected by this, that can have a pyramiding effect. It can be done. I'm not suggesting it's easy. And you can't give up quickly. And it takes a lot of work and you have to be determined. But and then that carried on into television. Then the FCC, when this cable thing started coming about, they wanted to correct past mistakes. Well, that's actually correct. Uh, in, in effect, the, the, the thrust of the origin of public access television was in order to right the wrongs uh, previously done in attempting to control the broadcast industry. Uh, in effect, to correct the, the, some of the evils that were created. Uh, we all know today that television is without question the most powerful, the most uh, persuasive of all media. Clearly, it literally dictates our social, economic, and political agenda. Recognizing that it has that kind of power and recognizing that in order for there to be such a thing as a broadcast industry as we know it, we can only allow a few to do it, it brings the question to everyone's mind, or at least it should, is who gets to do it? And, and for what purpose? Who gets to use it? If we're going to deny the entire population participation in broadcast and give it to a privileged few, then the question has to be raised is, who are those privileged few? All right? And why? And, and, and why? And, and, and obviously, this is not an easy question. It is particularly a difficult question in our society because we have a, you know, a really troublesome little document called the Constitution <laughs> and the Bill of Rights. And at the very beginning of this nation, our forefathers thought it was so important that everyone have free speech, that it became the very first amendment to our Constitution. It was that critical and that important. So the question has to be asked, now wait a minute, if our Constitution, the blueprint that we all live by, the law of the land, the law of the land for all of us, uh, can't deny any, any of us free speech, why can't I broadcast? Why can't I just direct a tower of broadcast? Why? Right. This, is the, this is the question that uh, since the creation of the broadcast industry and its technical nature that allows only a few to do it, this has been the thorn of the side is how we do this. In any event, public access television was created as, as an attempt to right some of the wrongs. Those remarks were recorded in 1987. And now with the woke community and the cancel culture and this terrible administration in Washington, things are even worse. But at least we can talk to the owner of this lovely 1937 Chevy. Barry Durkin, Justice, Illinois, so a long way from here. Uh, the car itself is a 1937, and uh, I never saw the show, but yeah, Bill interviewed me with it at North Lake Days in about 13. So yeah, that's one of my hopes in life is to find that show. People tell me I've, I've seen it on, uh, oh yeah, Gary, we saw you on, uh, on TV, and I went, damn, I missed that. Well, let me interject here that Franklin Park Library has now got all the shows, and they're supposed to be putting them up on either their website or something eventually. There is money in Franklin Park for okay. them to play all these shows and digitize them. So it will be available, so eventually you'll be able to look at the North Lake show, in yeah. 2013, and maybe you'll be there. Well, I would do the Franklin Park show and the North Lake show. We only ran into him at the North Lake show. Though. Right. We tried to get him, never could come up with uh, the arrangements to get him here for the Justice shows in the past. Right. Um, justice shows are now on, I guess this year is going to be a Friday night again. So it's all made out of pieces, uh, although the seats are original and all the body steel is original. Nothing's been modified. Um, it's even down to the original taillight housings, but they didn't put LEDs on them in 1937. Right. So um, I built the grill because you can't find a grill for these things. Um, put the headlight, the tail turn signals in the bumper. So it's it's all a bunch of things you add on to them, um, which makes it kind of diff interesting to work on because you don't really. Uh, I've got a great big file of all the stuff, um, and oftentimes I have to go back through and try to remember it. Fortunately, the guys over at All Parts here in Justice um, you have all the receipts. Uh, at least a lot of them. <laughs> at least a lot of them. So it's, it's been a it's been a very good uh, of deal of going in there and asking Ken or Johnny or Steve. You remember what I bought here? <laughs> and they can normally find it. Thank you, Gary. And as we look at the war bike and my racing triumph again, 
Cooch is going to continue with the auction to raise money for the Bill Will Fund. Tank bag. This is a nice one from a company called Covercraft. And that's your rain bonnet. 50 bucks. And it's got the map in there when he did his trip. Who's got 50 bucks? Anybody got their 50 bucks out there? Anybody got 50 bucks? And you can use it as a backpack, even if you don't put it on your bike. And it's... And it's got his tickets in there when he went on the East Coast. Anybody want to give me 50 bucks for it? Somebody make me an offer. 25. Anybody got 25? Anybody got 25? How about 25? Anybody? 40. You got it. We're selling it for 40. We ain't wasting time here. You got it for 40. We just... Hey, put this up on your garage wall. And then what you want to do is find those DVDs when this was on a Suzuki. I should have bought it, really, but... I want your number later. I might buy it off you. Because I got it for him for free. I get J.C. Whitney to donate it to him. You got a great price. God bless you. Thank you, man. Enjoy it. Dad, when I saw that last night, I got goosebumps. And I'm having a hard time giving it to you. I'll give you 100 out now. All right. Uh, all right. Hey, this is a really good one now. This is... This was in his basement. It's an embroidered American flag. When I go cross country, I meet people. This is the 50th anniversary Welcome Home Vietnam, guys. It's a coffee table book. It's got a DVD in there. How the guys got spat upon and disgraced. Thank you, Coach. You're doing a great job. And I repurposed a few of Bill's lovely trophies for this event. This one here is for the best car. Now the folks that won this trophy did not want to be on camera. But this is the car they brought. It is Auburn 1936 Boatail Speedster. As you can see, it looks beautiful. This is not an original car. This is a replica. But it is a great looking car. And if you want to know more about the Auburns, the Cords, and the Dusenbergs, there is the Auburn Cord Dusenberg Museum in Auburn, Indiana, which is approximately 25 miles north of Fort Wayne, Indiana. The owners of this car also told me that they got this car from the Bolo. Auto Museum, Again, which is in the Illinois. By, by the they Club. traded in Capri, two Lincolns and one sausage, hot dogs, Continental, and I believe they told me. So, and that was the, the trade. Here, they got, got this beautiful sausage, replica of a 1936 and, uh, we'll start the live Auburn Speedster. And now we're looking at the trophy for the most unique. This trophy, I took one of Bill's trophies that he got from Skips. He was voted into the Skips Hall of Fame. I repurposed this trophy, and it was awarded to John Pacetti. Okay, my name is John Pacetti, and my car is Rufus. And Rufus was starting to build in 1955. Daryl Starburst started building it. He made the monogram uh, plastic cars and everything. and. Uh, I bought the car about 52, 52 years ago, and I've redone it about three, four times, different colors. But this is Sunset Pearl, House of Colors, 800 bucks a gallon. Right, oh yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I got it so many years and everything, it's, uh, it's like family to me now. <laughs> so what kind of car is it? It's a 1951 Chevy. And then what kind of engine you got? It's got a 305 in it. Four-speed or automatic? Or? It's got a 700 R4 transmission. Okay. Yeah. So how much of work did you do yourself? Well, that's all I did is take it all apart and put it back together about three times. Do you do the paint too? Uh, yeah. You would do the paint? In my barn, yeah. Right, right. That's great. And you've had it how many years now? Since about 53 years. Wow. Yeah. Very good. So 19, 1970 then? 69. 69, yeah. right. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, and Bill, he took pictures of it a lot of times and everything, too. Right. So tell me a story about you and Bill. What did Bill have to say about the car? Well, he was surprised to see it and who built it, you know, when I first uh, brought it out and I was at one of the shows and he interviewed me. 
And I told him Stocker built the car and he, he didn't believe it, you know. Like, yeah, that was one of the first cars that he chopped and sectioned and customized, you know. And uh, he's got a museum now in Oklahoma. He's got 25 cars that he bought back. And he's got 25 car custom cars on the other side that's like your car, my mm -hmm. car, mm -hmm. car, you know. But he wants this one back too, you know, but uh, I don't want to sell it, you know. Right, right. So he told me I, I could donate it to him someday, so maybe I will. Thank you, John. It is a true custom car. Best motorcycle went to Rob Brown with his Harley Davidson Sportster. He's with Bonfire Banter. The best truck award went to Jesse Zanzaneda for his 1970 Ford F-150. This was a great day of gratitude to Bill's endeavors. Crusade and the TV show. For more information on Bill Wilkes Motorsport Foundation and Fun on Facebook, it's in groups MSU TV, Motorsports Unlimited TV. Bill will always be remembered by all of us. Contact me, it's teamdan45 at gmail.com. I love to hear from my audience. And remember, you can always search on YouTube with Dan Schmidt Motorcycle Racing for great motorcycle racing action. Dan Schmidt Politics to learn what makes America great. And I highly encourage you to visit the World of Motorcycle Museum, Winnemac, Indiana, four miles south of North Judson on Indiana 39. Give them a call first at 574-896-3172. It's a great trip and a great collection of motorcycles.